Welcome to the Startup Grind. Our featured speaker tonight is Bob Lalogia, CEO of Appointment Plus. Bob is a veteran of four startups. He has grown Appointment Plus from a small startup to now having over 75 employees here in the Phoenix Valley. It was recently named a career builder, top 50 places to work, and recognized as the number one software company in Arizona in the Phoenix Business Journal Book of Lists. He's, an active, he's active in the Arizona startup community, including being a seed spot board member and mentor, serving on several advisory boards for startups, and being a member of Social Venture Partners. He's also an angel investor with both the Arizona Technology Investors Forum and the Desert Angels. So get up on your feet and join me in welcoming to the stage, Bob. <laughs> Come on up. Have a seat. <laughs> Are we on? Huh? All right. What is it? Yeah, yeah. OK. okay. All right. So welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, Bob, we are going to start at the beginning, because we want to get to know a little bit about you. So. Let's start at the beginning. Tell us about your early life, where you grew up, what kind of culture, family, that good stuff. Okay. So I was born in upstate New York. So I was born in Rochester, New York, and uh, moved to Arizona when I was a little kid. But uh, I had the opportunity to grow up there. And upstate New York, as you guys probably know, is really, really cold. Uh, the winters are freezing. As a kid, it's wonderful. And I remember um, sitting by the radio in the mornings uh, before school when it was really snowy out. And we have this concept of a snow day. And so you'd listen to the radio, and they'd list off all the schools that are closed for that day. And I can remember when our school would be listed off, just jumping up and down, all happy, run outside and play in the snow. Um, so it's a great place to grow up as a little kid. Uh, and we actually lived out in the country, so wide open spaces, lots of trees, lots of woods, lots of streams. We'd, you know, we'd catch frogs in the streams and build uh, forts in the trees. So it was really, really cool to grow up there as a little kid. As an adult, it's a little different. Um, it's not so fun to deal with the snow, but as a kid, it was fantastic. And how many people in your family? What did your parents do? So I have an older brother and younger sister, and they actually both work in my company. <coughs> and have for many, many years. That's cool. Yep. Um, my parents, so when I was growing up uh, in, in Rochester, my dad actually had a business as a painter uh, when I was really, really young. So he was an entrepreneur. And then um, he became a meat cutter, a butcher, and was pretty much a butcher for the rest of his life. And then uh, my mom spent a lot of time with the kids when she was young, and then um, also did some, some work in daycare. And then when we came out to Arizona, my dad continued you know, with his career as a butcher. And then uh, my mom worked for Dillard's and also for Albertsons. Oh, cool. So when you were young, did you have any um, wishes, what you wanted to be when you grew up, or any inklings? I mean, was Appointment Plus kind of on your <laughs> mind at that point? Or? No. Um, <clears throat> the earliest memory I have of thinking this is what I want to be in my life is when I was really, really young, probably five years old, and I wanted to be a garbage man. I remember, <laughs> I remember they would come by, and back then, they would hang off the back of the truck. So you'd have a driver and then somebody hanging off the back of the truck. And I thought that was so cool to be able to do that. <laughs> Hop off, put the garbage okay, in, okay. jump back on. So that's what I wanted to be. <laughs> Very good. And so what were I your first few jobs? I that one day. What were your first few jobs? It sounds like we didn't actually make it to that one, but. Yeah, I didn't make it to that one. First few jobs. So I actually worked for a moving company in high school. So in the summers, I worked for a company called Discount Moving, and then a little bit during the school year. But um, it was interesting because I learned some business lessons working for this company. Um, I didn't make a lot of money. I made about $5 an hour. But... Um, I would be paired every time with another person. So that person would be the driver, and usually an experienced mover. And <clears throat> they were very, very different from one another. So some of these guys were really lazy, and I'd have to do everything. And then other guys were completely different, like really meticulous. They'd be very careful about how they wrapped the furniture in a blanket, and how they, you know, they put it into the truck, and, and you know, people in between. So I learned so much about that. And it was the first time I ever had a job where I was dealing with the customers. So I was providing a service to these customers. And same kind of thing, it was all over the board. Some of the customers, some of the people, you know, whose homes we were moving, would just leave and they wouldn't care. Just, you know, put the stuff in the truck and we'll see at the new house. Then other people would be watching us really, really closely. And they'd have a comment about everything that we were moving and how we were moving it. And so that was my real introduction, my first real introduction uh, into customer service. Very good. And what did you end up studying in college? 
I studied MIS, but I remember when I, I went to U of A. Any Wildcats? Uh, three. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so I, <laughs> I went to U of A, and I really had no idea what I wanted to do. I just knew that at that time, computers were becoming more popular, and I just thought, okay, this is the way the world is going. Most of the jobs are going to be, you know, related to computers in the future, so I might as well get used to it. And, and so that's what I did at MIS, which is Management Information Systems. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that I did that because it prepared me well for my career after that. And what was your first job out of college? What did you do? So the first job was with a company called Accenture. At that time, it was called Anderson Consulting. And <clears throat> I remember when they came to campus to interview, I had no idea what this company did. And even during the interview, I had no idea what they did. <laughs> and then they told me consulting. OK. Still no idea. I got the job, and I started working for the company, and then I figured it out. And, oh, oh, you wow. build software systems, OK, and big projects. And it was a fantastic experience because I, I worked there for five years and traveled the entire time I was on the road. And I learned a lot of things. Uh, one of those things was the concept of work hard, play hard. I had heard people talk about that before but had never experienced it. Well, with, with Accenture, you work crazy hours. And you know, there were projects for three months straight. We'd work until midnight, weekends. But the project team was closely knit. And we'd also always do fun things when a project was over, or if it was a project where we had weekends off, we'd go out of town together, or you know, Friday night we'd all go out together. And so it was that mix of working really, really hard, but knowing how to shut it off and have fun. And I've realized over, over my life and career that you have to have that balance, especially if you're starting a business, because if you don't have that outlet, you'll go crazy. Because there's so much stress and so many things to think about when you're starting a business. Okay, so in the mid-90s, you did start your own business. Tell us all about that. So I worked for Accenture for five years, and then I quit. Um, I, I was just sick of the traveling, and I wanted to start a business. I always had it, this feeling in me that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I liked fitness, and so I came up with this idea for a fitness planner book. So kind of like a day timer, where you have refillable pages for your meal plan, your exercise plan, your goals, and your progress. And so I built this from the ground up and <clears throat> started selling it mail order. And so this was one of those startups where I sold everything that I had <laughs> to keep this business going. The first thing to go was the 401k from Accenture. That was gone immediately. And then I sold my truck. And then I no longer had an apartment. I had to live in my office, which was interesting. And I had to borrow money from friends and family. And so an interesting story about the borrowing of the money is that um, my friend, or my, my parents have a friend who's rich. And I thought, you know, this guy has money, what's the big deal, $10,000? So I call him and I ask him if I can borrow the money. And he didn't make it easy on me by any means, and I had to pay him a pretty high interest rate. But he gave me the $10,000, and the deal was I was supposed to pay him back $500 every month. And so for the first couple of months, I would pay him back the $500 on time, had to be in by the 10th of the month. But <clears throat> on the months where I was late, he wouldn't call me, he would call my mom. And my mom, of course, would immediately call me, and the payment would go up. And the lesson learned there is it's much better to deal with a bill collector than your mom as a bill collector. <laughs> and what made you decide to start Appointment Plus? Well, um, I didn't know what to do at that time, because the, the tech bubble had just burst. And nobody was hiring technology people at that time. So I thought, you know, I like building websites. I like technology. And so I just started a company, this company. Um, but I started building the websites. I'm doing hosting, you know, email hosting, web hosting. But I quickly realized it wasn't going to be very scalable. And so I thought, I need to have a software system. And I didn't know what I wanted to do, what kind of software I wanted to build. But I just tried to think of an idea that I thought that over time, as the internet grew in popularity, it would grow in popularity. And I came up with online scheduling. It just seemed like a natural. Um, and at that time, you could, you could book flights online and book hotels online, but it wasn't very common to be able to book services like haircuts and massages and, and you know, grooming appointments online. So I, I decided to build it. Hmm. Very cool. Um, what was the hardest part of 
of biz ownership for you to get used to? The hardest part to get used to. Well, I think what was really difficult for me is having some sort of balance in my life because I'm a bit of a workaholic. And so um, a startup and a workaholic is an interesting combination <laughs> because you never stop working. Yeah, it's true. And so part of my problem was um, just making sure that I was maintaining relationships with my family, um, my friends, um, other, other loved ones. So that, that was really difficult. But one thing I tried to do was um, separate home life from work life by getting an office. But Appointment Plus took a really, really long time to get off the ground. It was many, many years. Uh, I worked out of my house for six years. And I didn't make any money for three years doing it. And that's where my wife played a huge role in this because she actually supported us by working. And she also worked in the business. But um, I got to the point where I thought, okay, I have to get some separation here. And at that, that time, I think I had two employees. And so I got an office and uh, I had, of course, the office at home. But it really didn't create as much separation as I thought, because when I would come home for dinner, after dinner, I'd go into my office at home and work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get it. Did you ever worry that you might go out of business with Appointment Plus, or was that one, after you made it past those first few years, did it work out okay? I mean, obviously it did long term, but. <laughs> you know, it was one of those situations where I never really thought we, I would go out of business because I wasn't going to give up. It didn't matter what was going to happen, I wasn't going to give up. And that's actually not always the best thing because with, with my first business, I probably stayed in it a little bit too long because I was pretty stubborn about it. But in this one, I felt like I had enough knowledge about building a business because at that point, I'd been in a couple businesses, you know, early stage businesses. I made a ton of mistakes. I knew all about software development. And so I thought, I gotta find a way to make this thing work. Um, and, I, and I knew it was early to market, but I thought if I can just hold out, I know this is a good idea, and I know it's time will come. And so I didn't, th I didn't think about going out of business. That's awesome. It obviously was the right one. Um, so back in the early days, um, what do you think the difference is then compared to now? I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but with your early adopters, I mean, there's, what was the process like working with your beta testers or beta users or anything or alpha yeah. as compared to what you think happens now? Yeah, the early adopters were incredibly important for Plenum Plus. I got early adopters right away. So I, I didn't know PHP or MySQL, so I went and learned it. And I, I built version one of a Plenum Plus um, with those tools. And it was horrible, but I got it out <laughs> to market. And I got some people using it. And y these are the people that, I mean, early, early, early adopters. You know, they don't care so much about bugs. They love giving you feedback. And I had some people that gave me a ton of feedback. And that really shaped the course of the product, um, all the feedback they had coming in. It was true market validation. But um, one thing I learned was um, in the world of SaaS, so this product was software as a service from day one, which is interesting because I started it in 2001. One of the things you have to do, one of the rules of software as a service is one code base. You don't want to have multiple code bases. And so anytime you do a modification for a customer, you should put it into the, the main code base. And so it's always an interesting conversation with customers when you tell them they're going to pay for it, but other people are going to benefit from it. And I, I didn't have that conversation real clearly with one of, <laughs> one of my customers. And he had all kinds of modifi modifications he wanted for the software, and I put them all in, and he paid for them. And I remember one day he went out to the website, and I had a demo of the software on the website, and he called me, and he said, you know, why are you demoing, demoing my version of the software on your website? And I said, well, that's the base system now. And he got so mad at me. He was so mad, calling me names. and. But you know, we got through that, and I explained to him that this is the way software as a service, it wasn't called software as a service back then, no. but I had to explain that this is the way this model worked, and I, and I got through it, but that was a pretty big lesson learned. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, so what did you think would be your primary target market, and did it end up being that, or did you discover you know, a you stronger know, area in a different one? Or? The, the first markets were pet groomers and massage therapists. Those are the ones that I went after initially. I'm not sure how I picked those, 
Those are the ones that just kind of <laughs> popped into my head as being <laughs> good verticals to go after. And I did talk to a lot of pet groomers, a lot of massage therapists. And you know, I, I built some requirements in the beginning, but this concept was, was so foreign to them that all they could talk about is the way they did it currently, which is okay. Because um, I didn't want to replicate that, but it, but it was important to understand how they did it currently and what, the, what their problems were. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it expanded beyond that very quickly into, into verticals I hadn't even thought about. And some of the best verticals that we serve today, like higher education, for example. So if you think of a, a college campus, there's a lot of uses for online scheduling. You have academic advising appointments, financial aid appointments, campus tours, office hours for professors, um, facility scheduling. So there's all these uses within a college campus. So that actually is a really good vertical for us. Another one that I never thought about is logistics. So we have some of the biggest companies in the world using Appointment Plus to schedule trucks coming in and out of warehouses. Wow. And I, Never would have thought of it. And so we have Pepsi, Georgia Pacific, Ecolab, really big companies using it for that. That's cool. But we also serve all the other ones, you know, the, the massage therapists and acupuncturists and hairstylists. We do that as well. Very cool. And how, how have you differentiated yourself in the market? I mean, it sounds like you were one of the early companies, but as other companies came around, how did you keep your corner? So one of the, one of the things uh, in being early to market is that you can add a lot of features. And so our system is way more flexible and feature rich than any other system out there because we've been around for so long doing it. But I think, that, I think the biggest differentiation for us is our culture. And it's interesting that culture wasn't even on my radar for a really, really long time with this company. But I had this epiphany, and this was about the 2010 timeframe. And I remember, I think we had 25 employees at this point. And I remember I was sitting in my office, and there were two employees literally at the water cooler outside my office talking. And they weren't talking about anything significant. I think it was, you know, what they were watching on TV the night before. And, you know, they're talking, talking, talking. And then they went back to their desks. And it just hit me all of a sudden that the company wasn't about me. You know, when you start a business, it's really all about you as the entrepreneur. It's your dream. And, you know, you're doing everything. It's really all about you. And I still kind of had that mindset that far into the company. But it just hit me that this, this company is about the employees. It's about building a great place to work for these people. It's about benefits, which I hadn't even thought about to that point. It's about you know, creating challenging work, a career path. All these things were really, really important. It just kind of hit me. And so I just changed my thought process from that base day forward it became all about the culture and I remember on that day I set a goal of having health care coverage for all employees within a year and we hit the goal and so that was one of my proudest moments to be able to do that that was a really 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 big deal for the the, uh, the employees of the company very cool um, so you actually had an opportunity to exit or sell your business and you didn't so mm -hmm. Tell us about that and what your thoughts are with that in general. Oh, yeah. I've had several opportunities to exit, actually. <laughs> um, we've had several offers over the years for the company, and um, I'm sure we'll have more in the future. But they, they weren't right. Um, and, and I think something that you have to do as an entrepreneur, when you get to that point where you have a business that is attractive to a potential buyer, is you have to think about a couple things. First of all, your employees. Is it going to be a good cultural fit for the company? Are there going to be more opportunities for employees with this new company? You know, what, what would I be doing with that company? Because I'm not going to retire anytime soon. Um, so I have to think about that. Um, financially, does it make sense? We have an investor, so you know, he has a say in this. Does it make sense for him? So all these things have to work out perfectly. And in most cases, they don't. And, uh, but one thing that I, that I did with the most recent one, um, a company was trying to acquire us last year, and part of our culture is transparency. It's being as open and honest as we possibly can, even to the point of being uncomfortable. And so I made the commitment to tell the employees everything that was going on in this whole situation with this company trying to acquire us. And I told them, you know, you guys are adults, and you'll, you'll make your own decisions, and what I'm going to do is tell you everything that's going on, and I'm going to be honest with you. I will tell you that in most situations like this, they fall through, 
Um, I will also tell you that these kind of conversations go on all the time with high growth technology companies or other types of businesses. Companies are always talking about merging together or acquiring you know, another company or being acquired. So it's very, very common. And they really appreciated that. And a lot of the people came up to me in the company and said, you know, I can't believe you're talking about this because in the company that I used to work for, they would say, you know, when that would happen, we wouldn't find out until we got acquired, until it was announced we're getting acquired. And, and so it made me feel good, but I remember the, the first all-company meeting where I announced that this was going on, a couple of the managers came into my office after the, the meeting and closed the door. And they said, Bob, what are you doing? This is crazy. Why, why are you telling all the employees this? You know, they're starting to get nervous. And I said, um, I said, you know what? I'm going to have another meeting tomorrow with everybody and we're going to talk about this. And so I gathered everybody the, the next day and I said, I said, it sounds like some of you are getting a little nervous about, you know, the company possibly being acquired. And I, and I understand and appreciate that. I said, but, I said, let me ask you a question. How many of you would rather not know about this? Or how many of you would rather you knew all about the situation, you know, as this process was occurring? And every single person raised their hand and said they'd rather know what was going on. And I said, okay, end of story. Um, but that's part of the culture, is just being really, really open and honest about everything that we do. Very cool. Um, how have you personally evolved as your company has grown? This is one of the most significant things, I think, that happens um, as an entrepreneur. There's so much focus on the business, so the product, the customers, the employees, that sometimes you don't, you don't think about your own development or you don't realize you're changing. Um, I actually have e evolved incredibly um, over the years. And uh, like I said, sometimes you don't even realize that it's happening. Did you just call yourself incredible? That was pretty good. Incredibly. <laughs> no. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, I, I really evolved. And I, I think there's a natural evolution um, for, for a founder. And I think that the phases, that you, the kind of the natural phases you go through are, um, you know, in the beginning you're doing everything. But then you have to become a manager because you're going to hire people and you have to have them doing things within the company. So you have to become a manager, which is really, really hard to do when you're doing everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you have to delegate and, you know, trust other people. So it's, it's difficult to do. But you have to become an effective manager. Then, excuse me, I believe you have to evolve into a leader. Now, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are, are natural leaders, but you have to kind of establish yourself as the leader within your company and spend time, you know, with leading, with leading the business. But then I think the ultimate is to become the visionary for the business. And um, a lot of entrepreneurs can't effectively go through those stages. And I think smart entrepreneurs realize that if they don't want to do that, or, or if they're not the kind of person that can do that, they should get somebody else in to run the company at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. They can be more of a visionary and then they can do their role within the business. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I respect people that, that do that. But I, I was the kind of person that, that thought, I want to evolve over time. I want to be the person that can, that can run a $100 million business. Um, but I realized that I, have, I had to change the way that I think, I had to ch change um, the things that I do on a daily basis. And I know that when, we, when we're a $25 million company, I'll be doing things a lot differently than I'm doing today. And when we're a $100 million company, I'll be doing things a lot differently than I, than I was you know, when, we're, when we're a $25 million company. But I'm committed to it. So it's not easy to do that. It takes a lot of study, lots of talking to other people, lots of ob observing other people, uh, lots of soul searching. Um, I'm the kind of person that just questions everything that I do. So I constantly want to improve. So I'm reading all the time. Um, what I'm, kinds I'm of things do you read? Different situations. What kind of things do I read? So I read business books. Mm -hmm. um, so it's mostly business books. And I can't get myself to read fiction. So I've attempted maybe three or four times to read fiction. I can't do it. <laughs> because I just feel like I'm wasting my time when I do that. So I always go back to reading a business book. And I, and I feel like... If I didn't do that, there's, there's so much I'd be missing out on because when you work in a business, it, it's very easy to get tunnel vision. You, you don't even realize it's happening, but it's happening. And when you read business books, 
it kind of takes you out of that and kind of sparks some ideas. And I think books are much better to read than articles and blog posts. I read those, but it doesn't have the depth of a book. And so I like really immersing myself, myself into books. And, and the way I do it, I take a really long time to read. I'm a really slow reader, but the way I do it is I have my computer open. I have Evernote up, and I read, you know, I'll read a page or two, get some ideas, brainstorm, you know, write in notes, um, go back to reading. So I kind of have this back and forth process because I feel like um, my intention is not to get through a book as, as fast as I possibly can, but to learn from it. And I learn a ton. And, and I have this awesome laboratory called my business that I can apply all these principles to. And so to me, that's one of the funnest things in the world to do, is to learn new concepts and then apply them. Very cool. Does your staff ever have like a, a guessing game on what book you just read based on what you might be implementing? Or is it a little uh, more subtle than that? So, no, <laughs> I, maybe. <laughs> For a while, they were, really, they, they, they were mad at me because I get up really early in the morning <laughs> and they, they were calling them iPad emails because I'd send emails from my iPad from like 4 a.m. in the morning and they, they'd come in in the morning and hate all these emails that they would get. But um, I, no, they asked, me, they asked me some of the books that I read and if something in a book I think um, is usable to them or valuable to them. I'll send an email to all staff or to the management team if I think they, if, you know, they'd find it interesting or could apply it. But I'm, you know, I I'm don't think they're, kidding. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's good guess. leadership in and of itself there too. Um, so where do you see yourself in 10 years? 10 years. So I will definitely still be involved in business in some capacity because it's my passion. I'll probably still be highly involved in the ecosystem. Um, that's one of the things I, I really um, care a lot about is building the, the ecosystem here in Arizona for startups and for, for technology. So I'll still be involved in that. Um, I do some angel investing right now, so I'll be doing more investing at that point. Um, I'm not sure if I'll be working, um, I'm not sure if I'll be working at Appointment Plus or another company. So it, I know that there's a lot of entrepreneurs that um, after they have an exit, they, they go into typically, you know, take some time off, but then do, do investing in other companies, um, maybe do some nonprofit work. But a lot of them end up going back to work for another company, usually a startup company, or they'll start their own business. And I think I kind of have that in my blood, so I'm a little worried about that. <laughs> I'm going to start another business, you know, if, if there's an exit with Appointment Plus. Yeah. But the bottom line is I'll, I'll be highly involved in business in, in some capacity. Anything else you'd like to share? Yeah, um, just I want to touch on what I talked a little bit about earlier, and that is um, that when I had my first business, where I had the pocket personal trainer, that I stayed in it too long. So we all know that failing is often part of succeeding when you're an entrepreneur, and some of the best entrepreneurs in the world have failed many, many times. And so it, it oftentimes is part of the process. And so you have to know when to throw in the towel. And for entrepreneurs, the way that are built, it's really, really difficult yeah. because they don't ever want to give up. But you have to be realistic sometimes and understand that it may be best to just end this, this idea. And you, know, you really have to be um, cognizant of traction, what's going on around you, and if it truly is a viable business. And if you feel like it isn't, you should just stop doing it and move on to the next idea. Because like I said with my first idea, I probably stayed about a year too long yeah. in that idea. It caused a lot of stress. There were a lot of lessons I learned in that last year, but it was very, very stressful. Yeah, that's really true. It is, it's a challenge to give up on your baby if that's yeah. how it is for you, but I get that. Well, very good. Thank you, Bob. Um, so before we do some Q&A time, we are actually going to do a little game called 21 Questions Rapid Fire. So this is where everybody gets to decide if they're on Team Bob or Team Not Bob. All right? So <laughs> just kidding. Um, OK, so first one, dogs or cats? Dogs or cats. So dogs, I think, embody unconditional love. So I got to go with dogs. Or monkeys. I could have thrown monkeys, monkeys in there. Or monkeys, right. Has anyone seen his website? <laughs> There's a lot of monkeys on it. <laughs> it's pretty yeah, cool. So monkeys are part of our culture, so we have monkeys on our website. It's pretty cool. Um, it's unforgettable branding, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, wine or beer? 
I made it all the way through college without drinking beer oh. because I don't like beer. And I still don't like beer, so <laughs> I have to go with wine. Okay. I'm not going to ask you red or white because we might, we might have to make you say white, right? Right. It's, it's <laughs> red. <laughs> okay, it's red. City or countryside? City or countryside. So ideally it would be both, you know, a little bit of each, but if I had to go with one of you, city. Okay. Hiking or biking? I used to be really into biking until I started the business, mm -hmm. and then I ran out of time. Um, I, actually, I actually really enjoy hiking, and I think it's important to kind of get out in nature, you know, fresh air, and it's a, really, it's a really good time to clear your mind, so I'll go with hiking. All right. Mornings or nights? Wait. God, this is a no-brainer. Yeah. I've never been a night person. Um, I, I should have been a farmer, so <laughs> I like getting up as early as I possibly can. So if I had my druthers, I would go to bed at 7 o'clock at night and get up at 3 a.m. Wow. So right now I get up at between 4 and 5, but I'm very much a morning person. Well, thank you for staying up with us tonight. All right. <laughs> it's tough. <but laughs> Your favorite business book? Favorite business book is probably the E-Myth Revisited. E stands for Entrepreneurial, Entrepreneurial Myth Revisited. It's a book that I try to read once a year. It's a really, really good book. And it explains why most small businesses fail. Mm. So it's a fantastic book. How about your favorite non-business book? Is there one out there? Yes, I, I don't read fiction, so I don't have any. No, okay. Nope. Favorite hobby? So my, my hobby is business, <laughs> um, but I, I do like playing poker. Oh. So I like playing Texas Hold'em. Okay. And for a while, I was trying to go to the casino. This is, this is bad, trying to go to the casino. Um, <laughs> I was trying to go to the casino maybe you know, once a month or once every couple of weeks just to get my mind off work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I stopped doing that. But I really enjoy it because I feel like it actually helps me with business because there's so much strategy involved. Mm -hmm. You have to really observe the other players. So you're looking at the environment. Um, you know, you have to think about you have, you know, versus what they have. You have to think about being aggressive because aggressiveness pays in poker. Aggressiveness also pays in business. But there's a lot of all these parallels um, with business and poker. So it's something I enjoy doing every now and then. And your favorite guilty pleasure? Ice cream. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> Almost everybody says that. That's really? awesome. Yeah. <laughs> favorite sport to watch? To watch football. Favorite sport to play? So basketball. So I, I think between the ages of maybe 12 and 18, I probably played basketball 50% of the time of my waking hours. Wow. It's just, I loved it. It was, wow. it was, yeah, it was pretty much all I did. So that's my favorite one to play. Okay. Favorite food? The ideal meal for me is pizza and ice cream. That would be my favorite. <laughs> I thought we were going to get Chipotle somewhere in there. I don't know. <laughs> that was good, yes. Mr. Fitness. Ate a lot of that, too. Very good. <laughs> um, what do you like on your pizza? We just have to go there. Pepperoni. Oh, all right. Simple. By. Is it vanilla ice cream, too? I like stuff in my ice cream. Okay. So, like, you know, like frozen yogurt where you can put uh -huh. M&Ms and sprinkles. Yeah. Okay. There's so got to be something in there. Favorite movie or TV show? TV show, I'm going to go old school with Seinfeld. Um, movie, so I like the movie Rocky Three. I know it's really, really old, but it's one of my favorite movies. And um, I think it's because in the beginning of the movie, he's on top of the world. You know, he, he, he was the champion. And he rested on his laurels. And that's the movie where Mr. T was in it, Clubber Lane. And so in that movie, he fights Clubber Lane and loses. And he has to kind of go back to his roots kind of go back to square one. And um, there's a scene in there where um, he's racing Apollo Creed on the beach. <laughs> and earlier, you know, he, he's losing and Apollo's getting mad at him. And then he finally passes Apollo. And so he beats Apollo in the race. And I've probably seen this movie 20 times. I get choked up during that scene every <laughs> time. <laughs> and of course, at the end of the movie, he beats Clubber Lane. <laughs> so I just love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How about a musician you love? Musician. You know, I think I'd have to go with Madonna 
And the reason is, you know, obviously she's, she's an amazing entertainer and very talented, but the longevity and the ability to reinvent herself over and over. And, you know, just like sure. poker, there are so many parallels with business, and especially in today's world that moves so quickly. If you're not thinking about how you're going to reinvent your business, you will be out of business at some point. And so I think she's a good model for entrepreneurs. That's a good point. Anything you collect? The last thing I collected was baseball and football cards when I was about 10 years old. Okay. But since then, I haven't collected anything. Nothing. Weirdest thing you have ever eaten? So I'm not a weird food eater. <laughs> so if I was on Fear Factor and they presented me with a grub, I would run the other way as fast as I could <laughs> and be off the show immediately. Um, I don't eat weird foods. So 